Hello, everyone. Bringing the lights down so you can have a nice little nap after, after lunch. Um, warning, I get a little enthusiastic about robots, so might wake you up with some cool videos every once in a while. But yeah, so um, I've been making robots that interact with people for 17 years now, um, since I was an undergrad. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the story. Um, but, but one of the things that I'm really excited about is taking inspiration from the arts um, to make more charismatic technology. So um, I'm a roboticist. And there's a lot of really interesting opportunities in robotics right now for robots that operate around people. So um, to catch you up with the field, like if we were thinking about some of the original applications for robots, like in the, the 80s um, and before and after, uh, we we'll often think of things like automation, the 3Ds, the dull, the dangerous, the dirty, um, robots that can go to Mars because it's hard for us to get to, or hydrothermal um, sea vents to collect data on the bottom of a seafloor, or do things over and over again in a factory that we don't really want to do. Um, but a lot of the innovation that I think about is um, for robots that also have to do uh, some of their tasks around people. And so that means that they have to use some of the signals that we use to be able to share highways with an autonomous car. Um, they're really annoying if you're on your way to the airport in Pittsburgh, by the way, because they don't care what time your flight is. They are following the speed limit. And, it's <laughs> and, and so it turns out that a lot of the rules that we think we can declare about how we behave, that when you put them directly into a robot, they don't always work. So um, a lot of what I do is try to uh, quantify what people do so that we can program it into robots and then run a lot of studies and reprogram and reprogram. Um, but yeah, cool. So my lab is called Charisma. Um, it's an acronym because acronyms are cool. Um, it is Collaborative Humans and Robots Interaction, Sociability, Machine Learning, and Art. So um, I have, these are most of my senior students. Um, I have some PhD students. I have an artist in residency program in my lab. Um, there's a guy just behind me, Jeremy, who is a theater artist that did some choreography with our robot chairs. Um, those, these are the chair bots below. Um, and I also have been working with uh, a Korean anthropologist, Bo, uh, right there in the middle, who has been helping us understand how to build cultural models of people operating around robots in factories so that we can think about some of that. Um, but yeah, so it, it's a lot of fun. My um, home department is in computer science, um, but my original degrees are in electrical engineering. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about the special sauce of our lab. Um, so one of the, pro the problems that we're really interested in are how we can design robots that succeed around people. Um, so robots usually have a job, right? Um, they, maybe they're delivering objects, uh, maybe they're telling you jokes. There's a lot of different possible jobs, um, but. I guess to succeed um, around people, I want to think about what should they, how should they vary that task around people? Um, how should they react to people that are interrupting that task or that they're bringing an object towards? Um, and what do they need to be able to perceive to be able to do things in socially intelligent ways, like who goes through the door first? Or if I'm running out of supplies, maybe I can move a little bit faster. Um, so I look busy, so my, my stash lasts longer. Um, and the the, the special twist of my lab is that I'm interested in looking at entertainments and methods from, meth from enter uh, methods from entertainment to help solve some of these issues. And um, one of the things that's interesting about actors uh, and performers is they really spend a lot of time thinking about the audience and how they're perceived, which is exactly what I'm trying to accomplish with robots that are operating around people. Um, so actors think about conveying intent. Um, they think about how to vary um, some of those communications based on their current motivations, um, and they think about re how relationships inform actions, particularly over time, so, so characters don't stay stagnant. So um, this idea of entertainment methods to figure out problems for robots in human environments, it doesn't solve all problems. It's a big space. Um, but the idea of our lab is that it can give us insight into a subset of problems at that intersection. So why do we care about robots in human environments? Um, well, money uh, helps, right? They're also fun, right? So, you know, autonomous cars, estimated to be a $54 billion market, collaborative robots, which are robots that are operating side by side with people in factories, 24 billion. And then there's this rising, uh, much smaller market, but, but still fast growing market of service and entertainment robots, whether it's uh, toys, uh, service can be, actually one of the, the, the largest consumers of service robots in, uh, in the world is cows. Like cows, like the milking cows, the back scratching things, like they have, they have had the most service robots. Like they are living the Jetson lifestyle. Um, 
Right, so so why does this matter? So it's, it's still kind of a hard problem. It's not solved. Um, so uh, there was a Baxter robot that was a collaborative robot. That it's sort of credited with starting this kind of push towards collaborative robots in factories that had the screen and the robot looks for a part before it picks it up. And that's actually really helpful for coordinating collaboration. So uh, they, they also made the arms so that, you know, if they hit something, they stop and you can push them out of the way. So they, they had to change some of the actuators to actually make it safe to be around people. Um, but uh, so that that's one thing. Um, but it didn't really do its job. But uh, there's this this um, robot that was supposed to help people find um, things in a grocery store in Scotland. Fired after a week, um, it would help you whether or not you wanted to be helped. People didn't like that very much, and they kind of knew where the gro items in the grocery store they wanted were anyway. So so it's failed, I think, on both a utility and a social perspective. So I'd argue Baxter worked on a social perspective and failed on a utility. It didn't really have the precision needed to be able to do the tasks in the factory. Fabio failed on both utility and social perspectives. Um, in Japan, there's a robot hotel where they had all kinds of different robots. Um, and in this case, I think some of those robots met that utility um, social criteria and succeeded, so only half were fired in this case. I mean, this is a hotel that has the premise of we are a robot hotel. And so still, like it, it's a, there's something tricky about making these services valuable to people from both this utility and social perspective. And then there, um, how many of you have heard of Jibo? Like it's, it's, it's so it like was like it had its Indiegogo campaign raised like 24 million dollars from uh, investors um, before uh, the Amazon Echo came out, right? And before the Google Home came out. But it didn't actually release the product. It was like took three years. They were behind schedule till afterwards. So so by the time it came out, it, it wasn't really that exciting anymore. But but it, it moves in really cute ways, and there's a lot of. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting bonding that happens. So it kind of succeeded from a, a semi succeeded from a social perspective, but but lost in terms of utility. Um, so dead, 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 dead. So in, in research, we were like, we we're like, this is an interesting problem, but it's not solved. And this is why you should, um, you know, work for my lab slash give me money. Okay, cool. So um, uh, this is the challenge that we're trying to solve: robots with flair. Okay, not exactly, um, but th the point is, so when you're generally, typically trained to be a technologist we, or a computer scientist, for example, and you want to solve getting the path from A to B, we often look at criteria like the shortest path, the fastest path, the one that uses the least fuel, um, but when you're designing robots around people, we do have to take some of these other criteria into account, which could include human value, right? Um, and then I've also been learning about ethnography. I'm going to skip that for most of today. But yeah, so one thing that's really neat I, I, that I will emphasize from that part is I, I, I think that it's really interesting to, learn, to develop robots in real world environments um, so that we can actually understand what people value. Because it's really hard, to, before Fabio, the robot, that grocery store robot was deployed, it was hard to understand exactly what people wanted from that robot. Um, and, and, you know, and, and not being uh, ab a able to uh, be agile and change its behavior system once it was out there was a big problem, right? Okay, so um, our lab, to review before we get into the main thing, we look a lot at robot body language, we look at entertainment methods, and then this, this idea of collecting data from people in the wild. And my goal is to create um, a lot of, mostly service robots, but other kinds of robots that um, operate around people and that they take human values into account, but also achieve their task. All right, I'm academic, we talk a lot. Um, I'll tr there's lots of video though, but we're gonna talk about expressive communication, um, the role of storytelling and designing robots to operate around people, and then how we can, um, you know, continue to collect data about robots um, in the wild and uh, kind of program them via their deployment. All right, so this is my PhD thesis in one slide. Uh, this is six years of my life. Um, <laughs> one slide, three papers. I think there were actually four. It didn't fit. But anyway, um, yeah, so I looked at expressive motion for low degree of freedom robots, mostly mobile robots, but also some little head bopping robots that keep on. Um, it's a, there's a good music video, keep on dancing. Um, anyway, um, but yeah, so one of the things I was looking at is how could we make robots um, that are really simple communicate by pe with people via motion? And, and so this was, we, we had a, um, a tradition every year at Carnegie Mellon of having robots give out candy. It's like the robots don't eat the candy, so they might as well give it away. And so these are the cobots. They, they operate autonomously in the building. And um, this year, we always dress them up, but the, the you know, what year this was, like 20, 2014 or something around that. No, no, 2015, taking candy from a robot. Um, 
I decided to vary its motion characteristics while I was doing that. And something as simple as changing the speed at which it's going down the hallway made people um, twice as likely to take candy from the slow one as from the fast one. And uh, you know, some people said that they had to chase it down. It was a little, it had, had faster accelerations, it was a little more intimidating. Um, but a lot of people said something like, it looks like it has something somewhere to go. And so what's really interesting about human psychology is that without any training robotics, when we meet a robot for the first time, we just like take a glance and we're like, this is what it's trying to get done. And like even without thinking about it, we change our own behavior. So like these non, like very simple cues from robots can completely change whether we take candy from them. Um, so yeah. So maybe if strangers just had a little bit more aggressive motion, kids wouldn't take candy from them. Um, right. Uh, I also write comedy for robots. Use the robots are funnier. Um, anyhow, um, so I've done robotics for a while. I think this incremented recently, um, 17. Um, but yeah, so I started as an undergrad at MIT. Um, started built my first robots as a as kind of an intern, my undergraduate researcher um, with Cynthia Brazil, who um, is really cool. Um, I have du du uh, dual citizenship with Ireland because of my grandparents, which is really cool. So I, after college, I like took a one-way ticket um, to Europe um, and uh, hung out, and like traveling around, Googling robots plus whatever city I was in and discovered this company, Aldebaran Robotics, which make the Now Robots and the Pepper Robots. It's since been bought by a Japanese company, SoftBank, but it means that I got this little humanoid robot very early in my research life and started doing comedy with it later. Um, also worked some other places. Um, but basically, somewhere along the way, I looked back to some of my projects and I was like, wow, there's kind of a, like, you could think of some of these as interactive art pieces. I, I hadn't really thought about them at the time, but, but the art stuff is really interesting because artists like look at how to use technology in a way to provoke people. That is a, a very unique perspective that could actually help solve some of the problems in my field when we're trying to design things for, for people. So when I went back for my PhD at Carnegie Mellon, this became the theme of my life. So the last eight years of robots and theater. So, but this is, let's go back in time. This is my second robotics project. This is before like microcontrollers were easy to use. Um, but there were four of us. Um, well, our professor was invited to make uh, an exhibit uh, at the Smithsonian Cooper New Design Museum in New York City. And so four of us had to make it. <laughs> and so we made these um, robotic flowers. And what I wanted you to think about here is how robots don't really have to look like people to communicate there's like even just something as simple as reacting to someone's uh, motion is is really interesting so some of these flowers they'd actually notice they would um, they would look for warm objects in the room and uh, so there's pyroelectric sensors and and for example that copper flower which I developed and so as you came closer it sort of track you it tries to equalize the signal on the two pedals and so this idea of being noticed as you walk into a room is like really easy for someone that has zero background in robotics to understand and start and like kind of beckoning, coming over. Um, but then some of the flowers would also get scared if they got too close. So sometimes making behavior systems for robots is actually not super complicated from a social perspective, but getting it right is complicated from a psychology perspective. So we go back and forth between what's possible for robots to do and what is actually compelling um, from a human perspective. So yeah. <coughs> I think we had also like stolen a bunch of like shavings from a lathe to like be the soil for the flowers. But um, yeah, so, so that's one project that the, uh, so you can also sort of see the art component. Um, and then seven years later, um, uh, when I was working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but was also working with Sin Labs to make interactive art stuff for parties, um, we put out a proposal to OK Go to make um, a giant Rube Goldberg machine. And I'll show you the video in a, in a second. Um, but what was so interesting about this is that like three weeks before they came, we were scheduled to shoot, they came back from tour and they made us change a third of the entire Rube Goldberg machine. They're like, nope, this won't read on camera. Oh, oh you know what would be so cool if this was just like a tennis ball and like replace this whole thing that someone had spent like, you know, three weeks building this like really complicated maze thing. And they're, they're just like, we want it to feel like someone in their garage could just throw this together. And I'm like, oh my God, you're doing the thing that I try to do in human robot interaction, which is like make the machine read to the audience and make people sympathize with it. Because Rube Goldberg machines, you'll see in a second, are designed to fail. Like this thing is three, eight, three days of filming, only completed twice. But so I was like, okay, that decides it. I definitely am going to work with entertainment people going forward and designing social robotics. They gave us a couple criteria. It goes from small to big. 
they wanted the, the machine to start the music, so you'll see an iPod in a second. Lots of references to their music videos, um, previous music videos along the way. So I co-directed like the machine for the first half of the video, like in terms of engineering. But like 80 people contributed to building it overall. itself as another thing six weeks of someone's life <laughs> yeah. look at the other piano in the back it did not survive that's my shoe <laughs> Lots of JPL people we had to throw in a rover. Only cut is right here. So this is their first music video that got went viral. Boom. Other televisions. We didn't get there that often, right? That tells you how often this thing fails. This is when it starts getting pretty dangerous for the cameraman. Big things are reliable. Always end your Rube Goldberg machine on big things like bowling balls that aren't affected by humidity. Also a very creative idea from the band to just, they really wanted you to see, they wanted a visualization of how many times they'd gone through it, right? So the paint. Very good communicators. But yeah, cool. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Right, so, I mean, Hopefully I've won you over a little bit at, at how, uh, at least if you're trying to get a machine. I, so one of the things I love about that Rube Goldberg machine is that because they're designed to fail, like they're kind of like the underdog. So it doesn't look anything like a humanoid system. It doesn't have a face, but you can sort of feel that it's about to fail at any point. So it's like watching a sports game when someone's coming back, and it's very exciting. And it did fail. I think if you remember the, the tire kind of rolling down uh, at one point, I think fr from that point it took 120 trials. Um, to get the you know the handful of completions that we actually did, um, but yeah. So so the last uh, seven or eight years, I've really been considering this idea of what else can we learn from intersections between performance um, and technology. So whether literally putting people, oh sorry, robots <laughs> on stage, um, or uh, just borrowing some of the methods to design robots that have character or different interaction capabilities in the real world. Um, so in the, the two years that I've been in Oregon State, these are all of the people and mostly students that, that have contributed in either to papers or projects uh, along the way. Um, building robots ru takes a lot of people um, and, and running human experiments also takes a lot of people. So we have a, a pretty large team. I teach a social robotics class in the fall and like usually there's a couple of projects that come out of that. 
Um, I just taught a uh, research robotics class in the in the spring where the students were designing the machines or robots that could play cornhole. Um, some of them worked. It was pretty cool. Um, actually, the winner was kind of like this bicycle wheel that kind of spit out some beanbag. Um, but yeah, so it's it's been a fun journey. So if you have cool students, send them my way. We also have the artist in residence program. But yeah, but the premise of the lab, again, is that entertainment can make robots that are both useful and charismatic. So remember all those service robots that failed? Like, they have to have task utility and social utility. And I think entertainment can help because it's, a, it's, it's basically an entire industry that is designed for the audience. So expressive communication. So when we make robots around people, why do they need to communicate, class? Um, well, one thing that's really helpful is if you're going to cross a road, if you're to, is to know if someone else is going to keep going or if they're going to stop, right? So I often look at the people in the car and make eye contact and see if they see me. And then, so legibility, this idea of what you're doing next, is really helpful in coordination. Um, and but it can also be helpful in understanding whether, for example, a robot is thinking about how to do something or just its battery died. So it's like <laughs> it's nice to know the task status. Um, but it, you can also convey things like relationships or character um, through communication that, that become more important as you have higher levels of social intelligence. So body language in particular is really helpful um, in robots that are making first impressions, the first time you meet a robot, or robots that are operating in shared public spaces like, like hallways um, that they might, you might not be its direct interaction partner, um, but you want to kind of have a sense of what it's trying to do so you can coordinate. So um, this is a, a experiment that we're <laughs> still analyzing from my postdoc, um, where we basically, I call it the robot duck crossing the road. Um, but what I, I want you to think about is just put your, pers your, your head in the mind of the driver of that car. Like, look how long it waits. <laughs> and, and, and think about visibility, too. It's small, so that it can't really see it super well, right? Um, and if you heard the audio, we're kind of laughing, but... Um, it's funny. Um, so this is officially a pedestrian corridor. We didn't actually have ethic board approval to bring robots into actual streets. Um, but yeah, but we did a bunch of experiments to try to understand how pedestrian, shared pedestrian spaces with like biker, like scooters, like cars, like uh, what, are, what are some of the implicit rules that robots would have to take into account um, if, if they were to also share these spaces? Or even pedestrian assistive vehicles, like if, if it's an automated wheelchair. Um, so a lot of, I've spent a lot of time thinking about expressive motion, but I'm not the first person to have done that. So um, this is a video from an experiment done by two psychologists in, in the 1940s um, where they're actually moving around shapes with magnets behind a sheet. Um, there's a projector. Um, but they wanted to understand um, storytelling. Like what, when do we start telling stories? When do we start attributing anthropomorphizing behavior? When, do we when is something an object versus an agent? Um, and, and so they showed this video to two di different groups of people. And one, they said, tell the story of what happened. Or in the other group, they said, just, you know, describe the sequence of what happened. It won't surprise you guys to hear that everyone told a story. Um, and neuroscience have since used these kinds of diagnostics to see if people have socially functioning cognition, right? So the ability to tell a story about what's happening here, like, is that little circle going to be okay? I feel like I want to pause so you can see what happens. <laughs> it's a big moment. Oh my God. Do you th I don't think the big triangle sees it. Oh, oh my God, I got away, right? <laughs> so, so, so it's like, so picture this with Roombas, right? <laughs> so yeah, so this is what I try to do with robots, minus this last part. Right, so, so what cognitively in our brain makes us attribute agency to something? So if you, if you think about a falling leaf, following the laws of physics, it's an object. But think Disney, if a butterfly suddenly s comes there and the, ch the leaf starts flying around after it, it's an agent. It's alive. It's alive. So that's the difference for us in our brain. We have actually parts of our brain dedicated to looking for faces, but we also have parts of our brain looking for biological motion. Why? We don't want to be eaten. Um, we want romantic partners, <laughs> so we have to read that stuff, and we want to understand affiliation and tribes. So, like, those are usually the three levels in in the hierarchy. Um, yeah. So, some of the stuff that we've been doing in my lab has been also looking at how robot 
Emotions can influence bystander behavior. So last year we ran an experiment where there were two robot chairs trying to recruit people to come and play chess. Um, and we were looking at different motion strategies for getting people to come over and be like, this is the white's turn, this is the black's turn. I wish we had painted the chairs actually um, next time. Um, but yeah, and so there's, a, there's basically a little label at the table that says, uh, please play one move. Not everyone does. Um, but you know, that that's sort of helps enforce the turn taking. But basically, we found that a, a robot that's doing this forward back motion, it's kind of like a big arrow. Like that's the most effective way to communicate to people walking by, it's this person's turn, come play this side right now. Like blink, 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 blink. Um, whereas a robot spinning in place is the absolute worst. People are like, why is, why is it doing that? And I don't want to sit on that chair. Like it's actually really hard. Like there was like uh, out of like the, all of the 70 people who um, the, the spinning chair like tried to attract to the table, only one person managed to sit on it. And they had to like chase it around a little bit. But yeah, um, taming a horse. Right, so uh, I have another student that's working on abstractions for, for controlling groups of robots. So if we wanna make rearranging robot furniture, which obviously we do because we wanna turn this into a dance party later and we just wanna say, chairs, go, right? Um, it's important for them to understand abstractions. So I have a student that's working on uh, uh, basically interfaces to do that control um, and make some uh, uh, inferences about what people might want. Uh, but also think about how can we actually rearrange furniture around people. So sometimes it needs to sort of imply, excuse me, um, but depending on how important it is that the next event start exactly on time, it could use different strategies. So, so that's what we're working towards. Um, we've also used the same base, which is actually a robot vacuum cleaner, a Nito bot vac, um, to start putting other types of random things on top of the, the robots so we can look at multi-robot groups and social communication. So I have a student, Alexandra, that's been looking at robot jellyfish um, and she's trying to design a uh, interactive art exhibit where the robots sometimes ex exclude you from their group of jellyfish, um, like, a, like a robot middle school. Um, but if you do the right behaviors, you can become part of the group. So in development, if you have ideas, love to hear them. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So here was like, here was like uh, one little video that she, she's, she's starting to use MATLAB to kind of come up with ideas for you know, this one is more like, I think this is more like, this is how to get eaten by robots. So, so we have a little bit more work to do. Uh, I think we're supposed to be the triangle. Or actually, it's a fish, but, you know, jellyfish eat fish. So anyway. Um, but yeah, so we've also been looking um, at other aspects of nonverbal communication, like collision. Like, so if you have a really simple robot, you don't actually have that many channels for communication. You could add some sound, you could add some light. Um, but actually, it turns out people don't mind robots bumping into them. So also continuing the candy distribution on Halloween. They're like, okay, I took it, go away. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Oregon State students are great. <laughs> One of the things we've seen in some of our like collision-based communication uh, like projects, oh, I think it's a fun title, um, uh, is that people there's a lot of reciprocal touch also. So if the robot bumps into them, people will, like will take the candy and they'll like pat it back, um, which is sort of uh, interesting because it's more like a, a kid or a dog. Like social touch is actually normative for a lot of human-human, um, you know, communication. So one of the inspirations for that project is that like uh, when you have a new crop of robotic students, they take mobile robots, and the first thing that they implement is collision avoidance. And as a social roboticist, I'm like, well, you know, that's not necessarily socially normative. So when can we break all of these rules? The first thing, like, you know how like part of education is like first you teach them stuff and then they think they know stuff and then you're like, everything you thought you knew was wrong. So this project's kind of like that. Um, but yeah, so we're also continuing to explore this communicatory collisions in VR. So this is a really fun uh, project where we have an actual physical robot that runs into you. Um, but the, the VR appearance of that robot varies um, in, like in terms of its material, how soft it looks, it's, it's, it's whether it has kind of um, sharp edges or round. And so we're looking at how materiality impacts um, s like the robot's sense of character for this very, very simple form. But yeah, um, currently seeking participants if you guys want to come to Corvallis. But yeah, so an another concept that we've been playing with in the lab, that was the nonverbal communication part, um, 
is uh, about narrative and storytelling. So one of the things I like about uh, things like theater over interactive art is that instead of it being like a 60, a 30 second, 60 second interaction, you actually can have relationships that change over time, which makes a lot more sense if you have a robot operating in your office, right? You're gonna see it on the regular, like, or if it does something bad yesterday, and the next day it's like, it's totally cool, you're like, hey robot, remember when you knocked coffee all over my computer? Like <laughs> so like, so this idea of like conflict, resolution, like relationship development, um, arc. So, uh, so when I had Jeremy Uran, the, the, the a theater artist in the lab for six months, he was teaching us about like, si like you know, simple structures for storytelling in theater. Um, so the, the, the simplest structure we got is this kind of the setup with some kind of rising action, a conflict, and then some kind of you know, resolution, right? Um, and so we've been playing with how to implement some of these structures um, into interactive robots. There Similarly, expressive motion, like watching the, the little characters move around, we also definitely saw a lot of these things, like the setup, the conflict, the resolution. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways we explored this was just directly through making robots dance. So like actually literally putting them in a theatrical context. Um, so for example, with robot furniture, do people always attribute agency or can they go back and forth between, um, as soon as it starts moving, between treating them as more of a prop and a character? So I'll just show you an excerpt from um, the dance piece that Charisma Robotics Laboratory at Oregon Jeremy State created. University created two I mean robot theater forward. productions over the summer of 2018. All right, so let's get to the, the fun, my favorite one, um, which is around here. Okay. Second human dancer and chair bot in Act 3. In this section, we want to explore how relationship dynamics are interrupted reformed and transformed through movement. The objective for this piece was to use nonverbal gestures and movement as a means of communication and storytelling technique rather than dialogue. The two chair bots and two human dancers share in a synchronous but separate duets. The chairs are almost as good. Almost. As the two humans skip away, the final moment of this piece found our chairbot performers on stage together, culminating in a final LED lit kiss. Collision based communication, guys. <laughs> Charisma Robotics would like to thank the development team. Production. So, yeah, I mean, I think one thing, the fun thing about a project like that is that the same concepts that we're talking about in general interaction can also be used to craft performances on stage um, and explore that. Um, but yeah, another project we did was um, try to create an interactive story where people could choose the arc. So last summer we made um, an interactive story called um, Adam's Apple on this now robot um, where it was, it was um, basically took place at this um, workshop for Hispanic teenagers called the Marichia Summer Steam Camp um, where they do science stuff in the morning and they play music in the afternoon. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so, so it the robot could tell a story in both English or Spanish um, and uh, choose how, like whether they, like the, 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 the robot was a keeper of an apple or um, guardiano de la manzana. Manzana and like and basically the person could take it or not take it and so they have this like conflict arc resolution and it's kind of like a choose your own adventure book with a robot that's bilingual but um yeah it, w it was just kind of fun to play with that structure and then we had the students create their own scripts um, about robots um, ideally nice ones but yeah but so and then recently we also did a project with robots um, as a partner in an improv scene um, so again we're getting back to this much more minimal robot. Um, and we create, we invented a game that we're we're calling Relativity, and it was an improv game um, where basically um, a simple robot and a person takes turns um, making offers. Um, improv terminology, um, so the the robot that makes a movement offer, and the person can make a statement, movement, all the things, and they kind of take turns back and forth with the help of a wizard um, for for the timing. The wizard person behind the curtain controlling the robot. You and your suggestion is vacation.
can travel on those days. And it'd be a shame if no one. So let's go. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, you're right. We shouldn't take them. I'll just turn a blind eye and walk away. Okay? I'm walking away now. That's the face, the X. <laughs> oh no, where did they go? The, uh, I think the wind must have taken them. Uh, <laughs> listen, okay, you could have had a free, you could have a free trip to Hawaii. That's all I'm saying. And see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so this is sort of an interesting. Why? Why are we doing this? Like, it's it's certainly fun, right? Um, but this idea of um, putting robots on stage can sometimes like expand the possibility for performance too. Like uh, it's certainly like a nice mental challenge, creative challenge for the um, the performers. We we had uh, seven different improvisers do scenes basically with these robots, and and one was in a, a condition where basically the wizard could choose any any movement they wanted, and another was in a condition where there was like a preset sequence of movement ir irrespective of what the person did. And the, like the, f the interesting thing is that they made stories no matter what, right? Um, it took them a little while to think about how to communicate. I th one thing I really like about this scene is the actor also uses his body quite a lot in the communication, and so putting that back and forth is really nice. Um, uh, also, like if you have the robot be a, like a servant character, it's generally really boring. So, like having the robot in some position of equality with the the, the scene makes the story tends to be a lot more interesting. Um, but yeah, the the person had to spend a lot of time being creative and, and thinking up the words. But this idea of using um, technology to help trigger our own creativity, which is the sort of nascent, but sometimes you need like just a prompt. Um, in the same way that there was a suggestion at the beginning of the scene, this idea of using robot movement as a suggestion for improv actors is kind of neat. And then, you know, it's just always fun to go to different kinds of performances. So it can just get people into the theater as well, uh, throwing a robot on stage. But yeah, so, so that's something we'll continue to do. I'd like to do an autonomous version of this experiment. Um, but yeah, cool. This is the preset motion on the left. Um, yeah, we, we, we did some other things. We have a paper about this that we'll find out uh, if it gets accepted in the next week. Um, but yeah, and so I've also done stuff with performance with, uh, I started doing robot comedy um, in 2011, um, maybe 2010, and uh, basically I had a database of jokes on a now robot's head, and it would tell a joke and try to look at the audience and see if they seemed to like it. Like, so they had these red-green feedback cards that they could flip one way or another. They would also listen to, it also would listen to the audio level. And we'd use that to kind of calculate an enjoyment level, and so that would use that the, the robot would try to use to predict. I would call that like the Netflix algorithm, like what what other genre of joke you might enjoy. Um, the truth is, it didn't really converge very quickly, right? Um, <laughs> but so, <laughs> but it was a nice thought experiment about how you could incorporate um, like live um, show, like like feedback into a learning system for a robot, and use different audiences a, as uh, data points for machine learning for a more social robot. So I, I really. Don't uh, I'm pretty lazy, so I, I don't always like um, to recruit people into user studies. So we've been kind of come up a lot of ways to like either throw those robots in the wild, like the Halloween experiments, or you know make performances that people would want to come to anyway, um, and maybe give the audience uh, surveys and, and try to learn a little bit about interaction just by putting the robots on stage. Um, yeah, and 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 basically since that I've been doing that for a while now, I've learned a lot about robot storytelling. So the very first feedback I got from actual comedians, like they're like, okay, algorithm, whatever. Why is it talking? Why is it not talking about being a robot? You put a robot on stage. If you are, uh, you know, pregnant, you and you go on stage. You talk about being pregnant. If you're Hispanic, you talk about who's being Hispanic. If you're a woman, like whatever, just talk about who you are. So the robot now like makes like all kinds of, um, you know, jokes about like its perception system. If you prick me in my battery pack, do I not bleed alkaline fluid? Um, and it also like spends a lot of time breaking up with me on stage because you know the there's all always this tension between a robot and its programmer so uh, that's like a, a fun fun like conflict um, to explore on stage and so so I have a, a new master student Janani that's been trying to uh, work on some of these concepts and validate some of the things that I think I've learned about robot comedy after doing it um, for seven years so we're actually right now developing a, a portable um, robot comedy 
like theater set so that we can just like bring it out into the wild and start recruiting audiences because the thing about research is to prove that certain things make robots more entertaining you sometimes have to ha also have really terrible shows and as someone that has done performance with robots for a while I feel so guilty so I'm and we're now going to bring it to like farmers markets and like festivals and stuff so that it's at least like it's like smaller audiences of like five or six people that can just walk away street performance style if they don't like it but yeah but we can still get the data so um, yeah, so uh, there's actually a quarterly robot comedy show in Corvallis called Sing You Hilarity. We just scheduled our next dates for the upcoming season. Um, uh, I don't remember actually when the next one is, maybe October, but if, if you Google it on the internet, if you come up to me afterwards, I can tell you when it is. It's not just robots, guys. It's also like grad students that will talk about how the decimal system actually doesn't make sense. Like if you're building something, like 12 is like a really good number that's divisible in a lot of ways. But like if you like nerdy humor, um, it's a it's a great event, um, and then I think the final project that I'll talk about before we we turn it over to Q and A um, is this this project that we did, which is like kind of a different approach, where we're having the robot um, be in a kind of a almost like a theater piece, but as a way to actually learn about um, data privacy. Um, so one thing uh, that I know as a person that has robots operate around people a lot is like we really like when robots know our name. Like when I when I had this like that li like now robot um I don't know I think I, I have a cousin that's eleven now but when she was four like I like I was just programming the robot for preparing for this robot tour guide experiment um in her house um and uh, in New Jersey and I just had it be like hey Siobhan and she was like for years she'd be like oh my god do you remember when your robot said my name I was like I literally just typed in your name and then it waved at you and it said hi Siobhan but it was like oh can know, like it knows me so like there's things that uh, so I know that using people's data um, in like socially normative ways can be really helpful for an interaction um, and so if you think about going to your favorite coffee shop like sometimes it can be really nice to be remembered and remember your drink and so on so so what kind of data use um, are people up for for robots for, for service robots so we basically did this um, experiment where we generated a lot of scripts about um, a robot barista commenting on two people's conversation. So it could be commenting on the conversation, commenting on their, their body language, um, uh, commenting by on like, oh, you have three traffic violations, like this implication that they'd looked you up in a database. Um, and we did this <laughs> massive um, study, which we called like the theater method, where we generated a bunch of videos um, and, and did an online study, but we also had people act in a script, so they didn't actually get their real privacy violated, um, which is hard to get experimental um, review approval for. <laughs> um, but they like they had a simulated violation, which could give us some really good first pass data um, on how to design interactions with high psychological risk. I kind of also want to make a robot therapist, but um, I, I want the couch to be the therapist. Uh, like when your hour's up, it can just like dump you on the floor. Um, <laughs> but it could like cradle you. <laughs> If you're having a hard time, anyway, hugs. Um, but yeah, uh, cool. So the in this particular thing, we generated a ton of scripts. I think it was um, we had like something. Well, I think it's in the next slide. But we had like something like four thousand online participants to to do all the different variants of the script. I think there were around two hundred and eighty-eight videos, if I remember right. But so that we varied a lot of things. So the people that were ordering the coffee, they were there on a first date for a job interview to interview a Craigslist roommate. Um, sometimes it went well. Sometimes it didn't go well. Um, and so we looked at all of these different variants um, to try to understand when what kind of data do pe are people more okay with body language they don't mind if you're like you look like you're having a rough day like that's not nearly as bad as like um, uh, you don't look like you're ready for this job right um, but but people definitely <laughs> po <laughs> positive information is really great um, so people like compliments even if it is on data channels that are would otherwise be sensitive but yeah lots of interesting stuff so we did the online experiment followed up with some of the, the results for this in-person experiment and I have to say when the robot was giving me a hard time when I was already having a hard time in a scene I like I back talk that robot like crazy I'm not gonna show you any videos but my students have them and they like to use these things against me um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll show you an example of the in-person scene. Um, are you the person from Rotate Cupid? Yes, I am. Two coffees, please. Two coffees coming up. And just so you know, your messages were really funny. You seem ready for love. Uh, you seem that little smile, that sneaky first date smile, right? And let's look at the contrast. Coming up. Just so you know, your messages were really awkward. Uh, you don't seem ready for love. Oh. 
<laughs> Poor guy, right? Like, this is a theater thing. Maybe the ethics board should not approve this study methodology. <laughs> like, aw. Some undergrads were hurt emotionally in this research. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, so, so I mean, that's the last project I want to tell you about today. I'm going to go to the conclusion because, um, like I said, academics talk too much. Um, but yeah, so we're really interested in how to make robots succeed around people. We think that using some methods from entertainment, either as like a structure, like those last things, they were acting out scenes. Um, and I think that can really give us some interesting insight to how to design um, robot data use systems um, and also get data from people in a way that's ethical and doesn't hurt them too much. Um, <laughs> they'll get over it. Um, but yeah, so we talked about expressive motion. We talked about the role of arc and storytelling, um, and and you know interactions over time, and even opportunities for putting robots in entertainment settings directly. Um, so in my lab, we really think a lot about robot body language. We think about how we can borrow um, techniques and concepts from entertainment to bring them into robotics, and we really like putting robots out in the real world. Um, Something to remember, just walking away from here, is that um, just like that video I showed you before, uh, like the triangles, do, do I think that one of the papers about it was do triangles play tricks, if you want to look up it later, hide or symbol, um, is uh, people anthropomorphize robots really easily. So this is like uh, eight years ago, this, this missing drone picture um, in DC. It's basically offering a war reward. I mean, like the, the, like the, the normal, like this is like a missing cat poster. It, like it's exactly like a missing cat poster. And people do bond with the technology. Um, that's one of my, my babies, um, Xavier. Um, and I asked him to give a hug to the robot. He like hesitated for like a microsecond. And then it's like, tree hug. Um, and so so it's, it's really interesting how easily we can remap some of our social communications to robots, even if they don't look like people, although they can sometimes. Um, and then the last thing uh, I'll leave you with, and some of you some of you might know this, but how many of you know that the word robot came from a play? Yay! This room is awesome. Okay, this event this event's great. Um, but yeah, Rossum's Universal Robots, a Czech play. Um, obviously, we had mechanical automata before that, clockwork mechanisms. But this idea of using robots in entertainment setting is is not new. It's it's old. Um, and and robots have long been Hollywood darlings. Um, I, I anyone want to make a I guess at what the ones on the bottom have in common. I like, are they nice robots or bad robots? I really like nice robots. Not all robot storytelling is bad. Um, so yeah, um, I also run a robot film festival. So if you guys want um, to, uh, you know, spend your next weekend after this one, you're like missing the nerddom. You're like, this was this event was so great. What am I going to do with my weekend? You guys should go to robotfilmfestival.com and check out some of our, our short films as well. Um, or come to LA on uh, August 3rd and 4th when we're doing the ninth annual Robot Film Festival. But yeah, um, there's no substitute for putting robots in the real world. It's really hard to predict how service robots will fail otherwise. Um, so uh, leaving time um, in companies for to be able to, to program via deployment or reprogram as part of your development process is really important for robot docs that are crossing the road. All right, thank you. Whee! Too many things. Yeah. So I think we left, a c there's still uh, nine minutes for questions, if you would like. Only for the brave. Are you brave? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's I love it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, you're asking about um, robot design, and it sounds like you're asking pr like predominantly about robot physical design, um, but also a little bit about its character design, um, which I would imagine it also involves its interactive behaviors. Um, so like, uh, so I have been trying to move away from robot physical design, although I did have a minor in mechanical engineering a million years ago. Um, but um, but I guess we still I, I'm really interested in minimal cues. So like this idea of just making a robot soft. Um, versus like a, out of a more like metal thing or cardboard does already like change the way people conceptualize it both in terms of how good it is at stuff and how approachable it is. Um, so physical design definitely matters. So one really big thing has been height. 
Um, so if we have, r like, like there seems to be like a nice friendly robot zone around five feet, whereas they get taller than that. So we use that in that, even though that, that was a really simple improv robot, it was like literally a, a research poster that we like put in a cylinder and taped um, and then put an X on. Like, uh, but, but, but we made the height kind of to spec with like some of the findings in social robotics about what seems to be friendly. Um, so you can do research about that. Like there have been some great designers, um, uh, I think Jody for Lizzie at Carnegie Mellon that have like done a bunch of studies about robot eye size and whether how far apart, like up or down. So like there's some really cool experiments that can be done in kind of some of the physical aspects of, th of the design. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's really important to think about character in relation to the what the robot's trying to do. Um, I don't really want a robot surgeon to joke with me um, before a <laughs> surgery. Um, like there's a lot of interesting experiments on like bedside manner. So in particular, patients that, um, or, or people um, that uh, are getting undressed or need help going to the bathroom, like they really like the robot to kind of be less interactive, less anthropomorphic. Um, uh, and, uh, and, but we see that in human behavior, like nurses sort of, they kind of like, they, you know, they avert their eyes, they're like more business-like in certain situations. But then there's also the times where it's nice to like be able to also bond a little bit, right? Like I had uh, a new doctor and I saw like trip to Hawaii and I'm like, why are you writing this in your medical notes? And then I was thinking about it later, I'm like, that is genius. <laughs> like a year later, like, like that's going to be so socially, like that's like a socially significant detail. And so, you know, like beds, like ha pe people who like get along with their doctors are more likely to take prescriptions follow their medicine trials, like trust the advice they're given. So, um, it, it, like so a lot of the findings we do here are, are replicating things in human human behavior. Um, but yeah, uh, to, but to answer your question, um, design is really important. Thinking about it is great. Um, yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. You talk, I saw that your um, I saw the first uh, like 2003. You were working with microcontrollers, which is brave. And yeah. um, thanks. Now you have things like robot operating system. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about like where things are going next, where you see the future of things getting even, knock wood, hopefully easier and more accessible? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, so we have uh, ROS, the robot operating system, which uh, all the servers are homed at Oregon State University, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it definitely helps to be able to share code. Um, uh, robotics of the field has lacked common platforms. Um, I think that when we make things that are um, easy to redesign. So the chair bots, like one of the motivations for, oh, I'm really interested in multi-robot, multi-human communication. And so we wanted to make a design that was really inexpensive. So it's actually an Ikea chair on a Neatobot pack with like literally some connecting hardware like that are laser cut. So like being able to share designs like that, but also think about how to scale like numbers of robots in ways that are inexpensive, um, I think is, is really helpful. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, as, as more and more companies are trying to make systems that other people want to use, I think thinking about um, the, the, the one of the biggest missing things is, is allowing for that um, evaluation and iteration period. So um, I, th I think that interfaces that allow you to review what happened in the wild, if we want autonomous robots, we need to be able to not watch them all of the time and be able to go back into the logs and see what happened. Um, so as someone that does a lot of human studies, like the idea of service robots that you can't see what happened is like a terrible idea. Like, so it's like that there was that toddler that was run over. Um, <laughs> well, like it's, uh, there were striations on his leg, on his leg. Um, it, sorry, <laughs> um, not the robot, the, the kid. But the, 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 so it was basically this like security robot um, that like, it's like a big obelisk system. It's, it's like, uh, but, um, but I think the big problem with that particular robot, for example, was I like people step on children all the time. Like, uh, like, you know, I've definitely done it, right? But like it, it kept going. Like it didn't say sorry, it didn't give them a coupon to the mall. Like it just like, it was like a hit and run. And so like being able to in particular review um, the deployment data for things that are like kind of catastrophic social failures, which I think that was, um, and like not ignite a major Twitter war is, is, a, is a good idea. But yeah, so I, I think designing robots for um, being able to have data review and, and like, like behavioral uh, iteration is, is a really good approach. Anyone else? Um, I noticed in some of the experiments that y'all did that y'all had a wizard behind the scene and some were purely autonomous. Mm -hmm. Have y'all experimented with like a hybrid system where maybe the perception is they're not really sure mm -hmm. what's the wizard and what's the robot? And have you, second part is, I guess, um, use that as a, a platform or like a research loop to help design 
a system that is more natural, possibly based on how someone perceives how they should act as the robot? That is a really fantastic question. So I am writing a career proposal to NSF right now about really? basically um, trying to make uh, this iterative design process with a wizard in a loop that kind of gets automated out over time. Um, that, that is what I'm trying to propose right now. It's a little tricky because the robots get so many things wrong. It's actually, it's kind of hard to kick out the wizard entirely. But um, for example, having the robot see all of the past wizard behavior, which we've kind of, we've made this UI so you can like abstract out what sequences they've used in the past and using like past statistics to um, help predict like what it could do. Um, so some parts are uh, like defined into like this interaction flow that generally works. But one of the things that happens is that both people and the robot break um, their interaction script a lot. Like if someone looks confused, like the, the human wizard would ask, offer more information about what happens next, for example. Um, we have this resolution bot um, robot that tries to get people to do exercise. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the, the one that we've been trying to target for this because you have this, it visits people in their offices like three times a week. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think if you have a, a, a sufficiently constrained robot task, you could do things where um, you start to automate it out to the point where hopefully you're just doing data log review and like that's your human in a loop part. But I think it's nice to still have a human in the loop somewhere. But so the wizard is human in the loop in the moment. Like, and then you could also have a, a correction wizard that's just like, the robot's like, is this a good time for me to offer more information? And the, and the wizard's like, no. Yeah. And so you can do like the reinforcement learning kind of stuff. And then uh, like I, we are trying to work towards that. That's an awesome question. Um, all right. I think that's all our time. Thank you guys so much for coming to the talk. Happy to talk to more people up front.